Good afternoon, everybody, and, uh, and welcome to the IP Showcase booth, coolest booth in all of NAB. Uh, my name is Paul Briscoe, and I'd like to talk to you this afternoon about one of the cooler parts of this, uh, something that's very near and dear to my heart, and that is PTP, and particularly the SMPTE standard called 2059, which takes this fabulous standard called PTP and glues it to the stuff we do for a living. I'm going to apologize, I forgot my watch today, so I'm going to look occasionally at my phone. I'm not bored and checking my mail or my Facebook. I'm just watching the time to make sure I manage it here correctly. So let's talk first of all about reference signals, because this is what we're going to use PTP to replace, right? So we're all familiar with legacy reference signals. We know these and uh, we love them dearly. Well, maybe not time code so much, but Blackbirds, Tri-Level Sync, DARS, time code. These are the things we ship around to get the job done, to synchronize our facilities, because we build inherently synchronous, low-delay facilities. We generate them in a central place, uh, usually redundantly, although if you have a small facility, maybe not, and then we send them out to all the equipment that needs them, and we call those slave devices, masters in master control, slaves out in the field, and we establish output timing, timing windows, we deliver time of day with time code, and so on. This lets us build synchronous facilities, and we can do cool things. We can lock it to GPS, and this gives us a better accurate frequency reference and also gives us good time of day for time code. So this stuff works pretty good. We all use it. Here's this, the model for this. We have GPS notionally driving a couple of masters with a hardware auto changeover. It's always a box of relays because you can't have electronics in something so fail safe. And we output these, say, three reference signals for your giant TV plant. And we send them all down a distribution tree multiple distribution trees, because this and this and this go down different kinds of distribution amplifiers. And we send them all down the line to a slave device somewhere. It could be a master generator in a studio, it could be a single device, it could be a camera. But we need to send this stuff everywhere. The masters give us redundancy, the auto changeovers listen to the masters, and they decide who's the best master, and they deliver that to your plant. But there's a problem. And the problem has to do, for example, with these distribution trees. If you step on the cable in the closet on the fifth floor and break that link, everything downstream now loses reference. What happens to your facility? It free runs. What happens to your system? Well, now you've got a free rerunning device or, or subsystem feeding your main system. It's out of time, things go bad. And there's other problems, right? Multiple signals means multiple distributions. You don't just have one DA frame necessarily. You have one for the time code distribution, one for the video distribution, and so on. So for sure the cabling may be different. And there's a capex associated with this. You've got to buy all this nonsense. You've got to locate it somewhere. And you also got to maintain it. And it's a single point of failure, so you have to protect it. So as robust as this stuff is, it has some downfalls. It's also inflexible. If I want to send reference to a new room, I've got to pull a cable. If I have a break in the path in the tree, as I showed you, things go bad. And these are old analog signals. I mean, color black goes back to the mid, mid, well, early 60s when we got composite video together. And that's all it is, right? These are old things and they're end of life. So if we look at synchronization as an analogy, here's our current model. There's your facilities, there's your master generator, and the master generator makes everybody happy. Except, of course, if you break that link, everybody's in 4.4, but these guys can't see the conductor because you broke the link, so they're in 9.8. Your studio is bad. Nice, simple analogy. What are we distributing? Well, we're distributing these things. Why? Historical. It's the same old coax we used for the video signal, the same old coax we used for AES. Um, it's easy to use. When you build equipment, these signals are native signals. So the frame rate is conveyed in color black. And, and you can use that then to generate whatever kind of video you want. It knows all about 59.94. It's friendly to us, right? The systemization technologies are all the same. BNC connectors and coax. When you're building a plant, why on earth would you want to use some specialized cable for something? And when life was simple, and that's up until about now, this stuff was great. But what are we really distributing? We're really distributing two things. We're distributing a frequency reference which ensures that signals can be locked and be stationary with respect to each other, unlike that, that one section of the orchestra that starts to drift off. And we want to make sure these frequencies are very correct, because every SMPTE standard has a parts per million tolerance, and we've got to ensure you stay on frequency. If you make a recording and you send it to somebody else and you're off frequency, they may or may not be able to use that recording appropriately. At least you'll have artistic content problems because you're recorded at a low speed, they play it back at a higher speed, pitches are changed, I mean, things can be bad. 
The other thing we transport is phase. So the vertical part of color black transports the vertical sync. That vertical, of course, is the biggest element in video because the next frame, you have a vertical, and you have a vertical, you have a vertical, it's just modulo one vertical. Time code, of course, takes care of knowing which vertical is which. So this is how we phase signals. We lock them together and we phase them. And then we make them coincident when we go to use them. And I say coincident-ish, because today we have auto timing buffers. We can tolerate a couple of lines of slop, but if you get them in the window, the machine will line them up. So using PGP, we can do something neat. We can virtually generate all this stuff. So frequency we get from H, typically, maybe subcarrier if you need super fine granularity, but we don't do that anymore because who has composite video? And the phase we get out of that largest periodic piece, vertical sync or the Z preamble or bit zero in time code. So we have frequency transferred, we have phase transferred. But things are changing very rapidly, right? Analog is going away. In fact, analog is gone except for references for the most part. And we also have no critical timing performance criteria like we used to, where you had to do burst to yellow to a half a degree and all of this stuff. Um, and the technologies are moving really, really fast. And this is the part that actually kind of leads to where we're going. We're moving from hardware to software in many, many applications. We want to virtualize this stuff in a, in a cloud. Uh, broadcasters are moving from digital to network. Voila. So this is evolving. Distribution, of course, has already started to move to networks and continues to move to networks. Everybody here has watched video off the internet, right? That's network. Consumption technologies, oh, that's actually the real one. You watch video off the internet, that's it. And workflows are all becoming network-based. Does anybody have a file-based workflow in their lives? Now we're gonna be looking at having live network-based workflows in our lives. So, do you see the trend? You see what's important to us, it's the network. So is there a better way to do all this stuff? Well, what would be nice to have? Nice to have, this is a have to have. You gotta do what we did yesterday. We're not gonna have a replacement infrastructure that throws away everything we've done unless everybody has enough money to build everything new from the ground up and nobody does, so fair enough. Be nice to have one distribution infrastructure. Why have three? One would be good. We wanna carry all the references on one method. If you have a dual standard plan, say you do, do 50 and 5994, that's two Genlock structures. Well, there's a giant pain. So it'd be great if we could carry all of this stuff, audio, video, time code, multiple video formats on one infrastructure. We want to provide redundancy, that's a must have, because the masters have to be able to be redundant. If you lose your master, your TV station goes off the air, that's pretty bad. We want to support new and future standards, and this is interesting. So who can tell me in 15 years what the predominant new video standard will be? What, what will the X by Y dimensions be? Well, we don't know. Right? We, have, we have no idea whatsoever. So we'd like to have something that is adaptable to use when we invent something new. We want something we can externally and globally reference through, say, GPS. And we want something plug and play. It's really nice with Genlock. You plug it in, the light comes on, you're locked. Nice and simple. But back to the theme, we want something that runs on a network. So it turns out there's a solution already out there to form the basis of our, our solution and that's called IEEE 1588 PTP. It runs on the network, it provides for a master, which they call a grandmaster, and slave devices, it offers redundancy, it can be locked to GPS, it can happily coexist with other network traffic, and network switches can help the performance of this in the presence of traffic. But you wanna know where's the frequency and phase. They didn't know anything about us when they wrote this stuff. Well, what it does is it transfers precision time Essentially, with a granularity of one gigahertz, therefore one nanosecond granularity, over a time span of 136 years. It's this really cool time counter, and it's used by a lot of people. This is not just some little niche thing we've picked up on. It synchronizes the cell phone network. Everybody hold up your cell phone. PTP is involved in this network. Your power distribution grid. A 0.01 degree phase error at 60 hertz when you have 500 megawatts is a lot of energy when the switch flips. You've got to synchronize that stuff tight. PTP does it. Robotics, CERN, and now SMPTE is using PTP. The PTP time counter basically looks like this. It's 64 bits of counting. Nanoseconds, seconds, and when these are all one, it's 136 years. So starting in 1970, this counter began. But the cool part about this counter is it has the ability to take care of our needs for composite video or SDI video, right down to the stability level we require. When we get out to a video frame, 
time code takes over, and when time code runs out one day, we have the calendar. So this calendar has a huge amount of capability that we can cantilever into our solution. By the way, this is the best part, I think, of this. Do you know what that is? Anybody guess what that arrow represents? That is your life. You can probably see your round of frame accuracy in terms of the fastest thing you can resolve, and you may live this long. If you live long enough to see this counter wrap, congratulations, good luck. But it's actually that big a thing. So it transmits really tiny packets on reserved network addresses and in reserved specific network domains. It's protected in its very nature. In the presence of traffic, it's very robust, and the switches can participate to help things. There's two kinds of PTP switch. One is called a boundary clock, where the switch becomes a slave to the master, and then to everybody else plugged in the switch, it looks like a private master. So what happens then is the transactions that happen to transfer the time don't have to go very far. There's another kind of switch called a transparent clock where the transactions actually go back to the master between every slave and he fixes the time by knowing the latency through the switch. So it's two different architectures. They both allow improvement of the jitter. So in the presence of traffic, in a non-PTP switch, the jitter is quite spread. And as we work our way into PTP-aware switches, the jitter is reduced. And these are actual measurements. So what? Where's the SMPTE frequencies? This is a gigahertz. Where's our phase? And where's time code? Well, frequencies are not a problem. And not to trivialize this, but we can cross-synthesize frequencies today without very much trouble at all. You can do it in FPGA. You can buy little chips. You put this frequency in, tell it what frequency you want out. It comes out. So not to make it trivial, it's trivial. How do we get our phase? So the trick to PTP is PTP defines that the value of that magical big counter at midnight January 1st, 1970, that counter was zero. And it began to clock over to gigahertz. And it's been clocking ever since. So what we did is we said, okay, if we define the phase of a signal at that instant in time called the epoch, we can now calculate, because we, we know how, how big in time a signal is, every signal, we can calculate the phase of that signal for 137 years because we know what the phase of it was. So if we say vertical was then, and we come forward one frame time in nanoseconds, we know there's another vertical. And if we come forward one more frame time in nanoseconds, we know there's another vertical. Now, there's gonna be a jitter of a nanosecond mathematically in this. A jitter of a nanosecond is, of course, irrelevant, right? So we can, by anchoring everything at a phase epoch, we can, in the future, calculate the phase of that signal at any instant in time. And that's how SMPTE uses, 20, uses PTP in the 2059 standard, is predictably knowing the phase of things. So now this means I can have two, TT, two PTP generators locked to GPS, and they can be producing video, and I know that even though they don't know about each other, the video phases they're outputting are identically aligned, because they're both calculating from 1970, which seems obtuse, but it works. Your cell phone uses GPS, guess what? That's 1980. And it still works really, really well. And in fact, I could be pretty certain if we all hold up our phones and the minute changes, they'll all change at the same instant, right? That's how amazing it is. And so PTP has this capability of epoch anchoring something and allowing predictive generation in the future. Wow, that was cool. Okay. Does it really work? Well, early on we decided to see if this stuff would work. So I set up a little experiment in the lab, and I basically had one PTP master and two PTP slave devices. And these are very early chipsets. They were little eval boards by a vendor who I won't name, one of the chip vendors. So I basically got a pulse edge out of the master, locked the scope to it, and then I locked the two slaves to this and locked a video generator to those two slaves' output. And there's one slave, and there's the other slave, and there's the jitter. And you say, okay, Paul, but I don't know what my horizontal scale is, so okay. There's the subcarrier that came out of it. It didn't resolve the jittering in between, but 90 degrees of subcarrier error at 358 is pretty tight. Now, it's not tight enough for analog television, but for a very first blush on a workbench in the back room, that's pretty impressive. And that told me, and that informed our committee, that this stuff could indeed do what we need, because that kind of jitter in SDI is meaningless. We can live with that, not a problem. This is unoptimized, 
is literally clip leads on the workbench, and it works. So it's pretty cool. What about the network? The network is a whole different story. We have networks every where today we have file-based workflows, we have control networks, and we talked about multiple distributions. Well, some of your networks may be multiply physically distributed, some may be virtually distributed through VLANs. Point is networks already touch most equipment, but these are typically non-time sensitive networks, right? Configuration control, software upgrade, turning knobs, monitoring what's going on, and so on. But in time sensitive networks, this is where PTP really comes to life. Things like SMPTE 2110 and things like AES 67 as we have over here. So what it looks like now is this. You have a master generator in the parlance of PTP called a grandmaster. There's an auto changeover function that occurs just like our regular old masters, but it's not a box full of relays anymore. It's an algorithm living in both masters and it can be any number of grandmasters and they all talk to each other and listen to each other and there's a set of rules which allow them to determine who's on first. So the, the master with the best clock quality and the one who's designated to be the master will be the master. If he loses his clock quality, he announces that, and this guy says, oh, you, you've, you've dropped in status. I'm taking over, and he shuts up, and he begins transmitting. And this hierarchy works with any number of grandmasters. So we're actually no longer limited to two, or you no longer have to do anything funny like have another one, another auto changeover, and things like that. These things will negotiate among themselves based on their quality of operation, their correctness of operation, and a designated priority. So if you make him the designated primary, him the designated secondary, they'll behave that way until he has some reason to be worse than him and he will take over. So they virtualized in PTP the changeover function we need. This is built right into PTP. So there's a greenfield problem here, however. What do we do with legacy systems? I mean, it's fine to have PTP, but we have existing TV plant and we want, want to put in an IP studio with PTP. How do we reconcile this? Because we need to have the same time base in the whole system. We need to have the same signal alignment in the whole system. And I, you can probably see where I'm going because I set this up. Um, and we need to have facilities and equipment to be able to use whatever they need. A legacy facility will use color black. A new facility will use PTP. But when you feed the new facility to the old facility, that signal has to be in time, just like it was coming from SDI, right? So this would allow a user to evolve from a new to an old system and move equipment around at will. What this requires is a new schema for master generators. So really it becomes a PTP grandmaster plus a legacy sync pulse generator master that looks like this. So we have our PTP grandmasters delivering PTP into the network. Only one of them's on at a time. They talk to each other and decide who's on first. And your slave device then can pick up the PTP from the designated master. You also have a new kind of master, which is your old fashioned black burst stars and time code kind of master. You have an auto changeover box of relays. You have the two masters, that's all the same. What they are, however, is instead of locked to GPS, they're locked to PTP. So now, the timing that's being conveyed on this network and the timing being generated on these signals is the same. What it means then is out here, when you have an IP facility and an SDI facility, they're co-timed, they're time aligned, they're synchronous. You can send a feed from this facility to this facility, it'll arrive in time, you can time it up. It's just like SDI from that point of view. And so ultimately, your infrastructure kind of looks like this. You have your old legacy infrastructure, nothing wrong with that. You have your new infrastructure, and that's really cool stuff. And you can now evolve facilities, which all live off this, this one. You can evolve them over here at will with a minimum of operational disruption. No need for frame syncs, no need for the facility being asynchronous and having to you know, drop repeat to get in and out of it and so on. So that is sort of the notional model of how you build a hybrid infrastructure. But what about live IP? And we're showing live IP here, there's all this talk about live IP. How does PTP work with it? Well, live IP uses PTP natively. It is the native timing format for the live IP 2110. In fact, 2110 doesn't even talk about color black. It only talks about PTP because SMPTE 2059 connects PTP to color black and we don't need to have that conversation. You use the right kind of PTP called SMPTE 2059 
and you are now compatible with color black. The timestamps used by the streams on the network come from PTP. That makes perfect sense. Now the timestamps in the media are not only locked to PTP, they're informed by PTP, so that streaming media is phase aligned with the SDI streaming media, plus or minus you know, packet delays and things, but it allows us to have, again, a synchronous environment. So the network senders, say 2110, they create the timestamps on the outgoing packets. The receivers use these timestamps to do two things. They align the audio and video metadata streams together, and they can use PTP to align those streams with other streams, as well as derive output timing. So the one infrastructure provides all these capabilities. We can also get time code out of PTP. It's a time counter. What could be better? It carries, time, it carries uh, leap seconds, it carries um, time zone, it allows us to carry uh, 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 daylight savings time. So PTP and its metadata allows us to actually generate time of day, real precise, we all flip at the same time, time of day, and thus we can generate real-time time code from PTP. The master doesn't have to generate any of this, the slave does all this virtually from the one PTP link from its master. We can even use it for locking non-IP equipment simply because the relationships to media signals are defined in SIMP 2059. SIMP 2059, look at that. It's a two-part document suite. The document number one describes the SIMP epoch, and we basically say, oh, the SIMP epoch? Oh, it's the PTP epoch, but we'll give it our own name so we, you know, understand. And we talk about the alignment points for signals. So January 1st, 1970, midnight, was the zero crossing of line one in NTSC. Okay, I can now calculate it until at least 136 years. We also provide formulae so you can do this calculation. Now, in reality you can't do this because the numerical precision required is extremely difficult, right? If you're calculating video frames from 1970, you're gonna accumulate errors if you use a simple formula because you can't get enough mathematical precision reasonably in a product. But these models allow you to implement a strategic way to solve this and prove them against these models. And then we also come up with the formula and the algorithms for deterministic, deterministically calculating ST12 time code, including drop frame, excuse me, well, including drop frame, of course, but including daily jam. In North America, we all have to do daily jams in our plant overnight to keep the clock on time, gather up that accumulated error. We've actually formalized that in SIPI 2059 to allow you to build multiple systems, all of which do the daily jam in the same way at the same time, so your time code everywhere is always the same. You don't have the problem of, oh, he, did, he jammed at 2 a.m., he jammed at 4 a.m., there's a one-hour offset, or there's a milliseconds offset, whatever, you know, when I feed him from him, there's an error. That all goes away. We can also get date out of this, right? It knows the date, it knows the time. So all of our time code and our time code date payload is taken care of. There's a second document. It's called 2059-2. And this is a PTP thing. PTP has a concept of a profile. And the power people have one, and the cell phone people have one. It's a behavioral description for how PTP behaves on the network, things like how many messages per second it transmits and things. It also conveys specific metadata for that application. So what we do with our profile is we talk about things like the message rates and so on, and we also talk about sending some specific metadata. So one example, when I send color blackout, the receiving device can sniff that signal and it knows it's 525, it's 625, right? That's all gone here, it's virtual. So this metadata actually tells the slave, by the way, we're 525 in this house. And it allows the slave to know something that is missing when you don't have color black, but we're conveying that as metadata. So the slave still knows everything it needs. It just doesn't have to sniff it out of the signal. Signal generation, we tell the alignments, and that includes AES3 and that includes time code. So you can take a 2059 counter value at any instant in time and determine the phase of any signal, any video signal in the standard, any audio signal, or time code. So they, we convey the alignment point definitions and formula to convert into. And as well, you can actually, if you had the numerical precision, you could take PTP, feed it into a numerical engine, and directly generate signals, as opposed to find an alignment point to reset an ongoing state machine like we do today. 
but I digress. So back to the picture, what's going to come first, chicken or egg? Um, we have multiple scenarios available. Do you replace your plant infrastructure with PTP and keep your SDI islands and evolve that? Or do you keep your SDI infrastructure, add PTP, and start building islands of IP? SMPTE 2059 and PTP allow you to do either in any mix you want because 2059 PTP carries virtually carries all of our reference signals. So you can use real reference where you want it. You can use PTP to virtually derive it inside equipment where you want it. We can build dual reference equipment. And if the industry does it or not, remains to be seen. We're at the point now where manufacturers are going to have to start to think about it because this stuff's all real. And I presume many will. So you have equipment that today will lock to color black. And in the future, you can flip the switch and make it lock to PTP. And by the way, nothing on the output will change It'll just stop using the BNC, it'll start using the network. Will this stuff really play nicely on media networks? Well, I invite you to come over and look at this wall of stuff here. Um, and this is all SMPTE 2110 locked to PTP. Does it play nicely in the presence of media? We have 10 gigabit links here, some of them loaded up to six, seven, eight gigabits. PTP is running down those links to every device and I gotta tell you, it works. Will users trust everything on one interface? There's an interesting question. So now your reference and your media is on one hose. And many people find that scary, and I understand that. Today you have Genlock on one and media on the other. Well, you can't break either. Things will still go bad. And the cool thing we can do now is we can provide two interfaces with full redundancy. We can have video and audio and metadata and PTP on both of them. And you can pull one hose and you still have your whole bundle. So from a SMPTE standards point of view, we think users will trust everything on one interface as we evolve to this new world. How long is this ramp? I have no idea. I can't possibly guess. I think the adoption of this will come quickly as SMPTE 2110 becomes adopted. How long before Genlock fades into the dark? I can't guess. People still have composite video in some places. That should have been gone a long time ago. Some people still have SDSDI. Still around. So this ramp could be certainly a handful of years, but as time goes by and it makes more and more sense to go to IP, we're going to see the use of legacy reference signals drop. No one knows the answer to that. But one thing we do know is the ramp for PTP is now climbing. We have been doing testing, thanks to our friends at Fox Network Engineering and Operations in Woodlands, Texas. They have sponsored meetings where they provided rack space and tables and chairs and equipment and cooling and all this power. And we've done a bunch of testing and oh, look at this. That kind of looks like that thing I did on the bench like, you know, seven or eight years ago. It does work. Oh, by the way, there's no jitter anymore because these are actual real products without clip leads. And we're even now getting some time code to work. So this stuff is actually going and working. So the conclusions from our interop tests are this stuff works as intended. The standard needs a little bit of adjustment. We released it two years ago, this NAB, and we've discovered a few clarifications we can make in the standard to make it easier to implement but we found no fundamental problems. The performance goals that we've, uh, we've come up with are adequate and achievable. And we've now tested all the areas of 2059 at least once that we wanted to cover. And we have ongoing interop testing still because we're evolving our designs and our implementations. And so there will be future interops to test more deeply and more broadly. We also got to write an engineering guideline because this stuff's complicated and it would be awful to write a standard and throw it at the industry and say, oh, figure it out. So we have a list of engineering guidelines that we have to author as well. These give context, right? And some clarifications. And every vendor who participated has had the opportunity of benefiting from everybody's experience in improving their own products. At SMPTE, we're doing EGs, doing our interop testing. We're now, <laughs> we're one year at the two year, we're two years at the one year review point, but we're holding off updating because we want to learn as much as possible before we update the documents. And by the way, guess what? SIPTI 2110 uses this stuff very successfully. So in summary, this stuff works happily alongside your legacy systems. This will now enable new workflows. We're on a network. You can get out of the building, you can go to the cloud, you can do all sorts of cool stuff that we can't do with SDI. We can build systems with higher confidence. You can have redundant networks, redundant timing, all of this. Reduce CapEx, reduce OpEx. This can be evolutionary or revolutionary. You're welcome to build a building and go all 2110 network. That's fine with, fine with me, I think it'd be great. 
and we can support anything we see in the future. And the reason is this, and I'll tell you quickly. I talked about some ridiculous video raster format. All you got to do is describe where it was midnight January 1st, 1970. And PTP can then virtualize how we do it. So we can invent stuff and we can then hook it up to PTP without knowing what it's going to be. So this stuff's coming to a network, a network near you, right here, and it's coming real soon. Please have a look at what's going on here. We actually have a PTP demo specifically, as well as all the media stuff. I'd invite you to do this. Please get your badge scanned, and you can keep up to date on what's going on in this stuff. We'll be sending emails on that. And by all means, please attend some of the other presentations. We have a full suite of presentations covering all of this stuff uh, running every day. And I think that's it time-wise, and I thank you for your attention. <laughs>